Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. This is actually my first time giving a presentation at the Wheaton Library. And Friday was my first time being in the library. I'm not a Wheaton resident. I live in West Chicago. But this is a fantastic um, space. So very nice library. And thanks for your time. Uh, a lot of people here, so I'm really excited to be out here. As mentioned, my name is Ryan Kyler. I'm the Stroke Education Coordinator at Northwestern Medicine, Central DuPage, and Delnor Hospitals. So my background is all nursing, all critical care nursing for the last eight years. I've been working at CDH on the other side of things, taking care of stroke patients um, after the stroke has happened. And this role opened up in June, and our goal with the role is to get out to the communities that we serve and to educate people on how to prevent stroke, how to recognize stroke, and why it's so important to call 911. And so we're trying to do it as many different ways as possible, which is why we're having this videotaped. It'll be available on the um, cable television channel for Wheaton. It'll be available on the Wheaton website. We're doing social media. We're getting out in school. So trying to reach as many people as possible. So really appreciate you all being here. The whole presentation is about 45 minutes. And I'm going to leave some time at the end for questions. I love questions. Those are the best part. Um, also, I'm a very laid back speaker. So if I'm speaking too fast, if I'm not loud enough, first of all, can everybody hear me? Good. I've never been accused of being too quiet, but if you need me to repeat something, feel free to you know, raise your hand, ask a question. Before I get started, what I like to always ask people is a rhetorical question. When I say the word stroke, what sort of mental image comes into your head? Person. Yes. Paralysis. Mm -hmm. Loss of speech. Loss of speech. If you're like most Americans, generally what you think about is an elderly person. People think about stroke as an elderly person's disease, but stroke can affect everybody. Stroke is a 41-year-old man who's at work at 9.30 on a Tuesday. He runs five days a week. He doesn't take any medication. And he's leaving a voicemail for his client. And as he's leaving the voicemail, he starts to slur his words. And he realizes he's not really making sense. So he hangs up the phone, thinks maybe my blood sugar is low. I'm going to go to the break room. I'm going to get something to eat. I'll be better. Goes on to his 10 o'clock meeting. And luckily, the people he works with are paying attention because at his 10 o'clock meeting, they say, you know, he's really not making sense. He's confused. He's slurring his words. So they call 911, and our mobile stroke unit shows up, gives him care right there on the premises, and he's able to be back at work a week later with no deficits. Stroke is a 32-year-old woman who has a couple young kids. She's riding her bike around her neighborhood, falls off the bike, and hurts her neck. And so the next couple of days, she keeps adjusting her neck because it's got a, a kink in it. And on the third day, she has an incredible onset of dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. And then she ends up in our ICU because she's had a stroke in the back of her brain. And the stroke is a 64-year-old man who's at a party, a retirement party with his wife. He leaves an hour earlier than she does to go home. She comes home an hour later and finds him on the porch, completely confused and unable to get into his house. So she calls 911, and he gets the treatment he needs, and he has no deficits. Stroke can affect everybody. And not only does it affect the people having the stroke, we know that stroke affects caregivers, affects loved ones as well. So our goal is to reach out and talk about stroke, talk about why it's so important, and to help people know how to recognize it and prevent it. Stroke is um, a very common disease. It, about 795,000 Americans each year have a stroke. That works out to one stroke every 40 seconds someone's having a stroke. And when you look at that, Statistic, what's also important to note is that projections show that over the next 10 years, by the year 2030, an additional 3.8 million Americans over the age of 18 will have had a stroke. So that's an additional 4% of our entire population. Stroke is something that is actually increasing in prevalence, meaning more people are going to have stroke. What we have seen, though, is that stroke used to be the number four leading cause of death, but over time, it's dropped to the number fifth leading cause of death. So more people are surviving stroke. They're doing that because they're managing their risk factors better. The medical treatment we offer is getting better. Our research is getting better. But despite the fact that it's now the number five leading cause of death and more people are surviving it, stroke is still the number one cause of preventable medical disability. So as a country, we spend about $36 billion every year on the medical disability that results from stroke. And when you think about it, all the treatment we can offer, as quickly as we can get it, it all begins with someone recognizing the symptoms, either in themselves or in the person they're with, and calling 911. But what we find is about 37% of all Americans cannot accurately name even one warning sign of stroke. And so that's what we're out here to talk about. We have to help people to recognize it, because stroke looks different with different people. 
So how do you recognize the symptoms and why is it so important to call 911? And we also talk about calling 911 a lot. Only about 50% of the people in the country that are having a stroke call 911 for their stroke. And that's the same for this area too. So that's the other half of the people showing up to the emergency department that are driving themselves, their loved ones are driving them, and not only is that unsafe, it slows down the process because we know the quicker you recognize something and the quicker you get to treatment, the better chance of a good outcome you have, and that's our goal. But before I get too far, I want to define what is a stroke. The best way to think about a stroke is think about it like a brain attack. Sounds kind of funny, but it's the same concept as a heart attack. So a part of your brain that's getting blood is no longer getting blood for whatever reason. And we'll talk about two of the main reasons for stroke. What happens though is when that brain is not getting blood, brain cells are dying. And we always say the term, time is brain. But what does that mean? We used to show people this graph and we used to only show them the first two columns. So neurons are your brain cells and synapses are the connections between them and those are huge numbers. But what we found is people didn't, the numbers didn't mean a lot because you have millions of brain cells. But what researchers did is they put this third column in here. And what they wanted to compare is how many brain cells you lose during a stroke compared to normal aging. In normal aging, we lose brain cells. Brain cells die, that's normal. When you look at the amount of brain cells lost per minute, in the average stroke, the average person loses almost two million brain cells in one minute of not getting blood to that part of the brain. That's the same as 3.1 weeks of normal aging. And then when the researchers looked at over 10,000 stroke cases for the whole country and averaged out the average stroke, in the average stroke, a person loses 1.2 billion brain cells from the loss of blood. And that is the same as 36 years of regular aging. So that's important. The quicker we act, the better. When we talk about the disability that results from stroke, it's not just inability to walk or difficulty doing your daily activities. It's ability to communicate. It's cognitive function. We know that people who have stroke are more at risk for early onset dementia down the road. So brain health in general. And so everything we talk about is to move as fast as possible. Yes, ma'am. Per stroke, you lose the same amount of brain cells as 36 years of regular brain aging. Your body doesn't necessarily age, but as you age, you lose brain cells, and it's the same amount as 36 years of normal brain aging in one stroke. Because stroke is um, obviously devastating, but the quicker you act, the better. That's why we are here talking about this. <coughs> yes. So after a stroke, the brain cells that die do not regenerate. But there is a period after a stroke where that first three months, you have what we'll call brain plasticity, meaning you're able to reroute certain functions that used to be covered by the lost brain and be able to teach it to the other parts of the brain. So we work very hard with people immediately after their stroke for physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, because we know our best chance to get people recovered is in that first three months. And we'll do it for years. But in that first three months, we work super hard because the brain can reroute certain functions that it used to not cover. Um, so while you don't gain the brain cells back, if you work hard, um, studies show that you can regain some of those functions. Very good question. What I want to do real quick, I want to talk about the two different kinds of stroke. And I have two very short videos to kind of illustrate what that looks like. The first type of stroke is ischemic. So that's a clot. Think of a blood clot. That's about 87% of strokes. The example I like to give is if you have a sink full of water and a clog in the P-trap beneath the sink, the water's not going to drain out of the sink to wherever it's supposed to go. So what can you do? You can put some Drano down the sink. That's kind of the example. We have a clot-busting drug we give that gets in your blood and breaks up the clot. Or you could use a rotor rooter or the plastic tool that comes with the Drano and actually pull the clog out. That way the water can go from the sink and drain to where it's supposed to go. The other type of stroke is a hemorrhagic or a bleeding stroke. That's only about 13% of strokes. And what happens is the blood vessel feeding that part of the brain, it bursts for whatever reason. And so now that part of the brain is no longer getting blood, and the blood that leaks out surrounds that part of the brain and begins to press on it, which can cause further damage. So I want to show these two quick videos. They're each like under a minute, but they really illustrate it well, so you can see what it would look like. And then we'll um, move on here.
A stroke occurs when the blood flow in part of your brain is blocked. After just a few minutes, the starved brain cells begin to die. Normally, the brain receives blood via two major pairs of arteries, which branch throughout brain tissue and supply your brain cells with a constant flow of oxygen, glucose, and nutrients necessary for their functions. In one type of stroke, ischemic stroke, an artery in your brain narrows or becomes completely blocked preventing normal blood flow. The blockage may be caused by a blood clot, also called a thrombus, which forms in an unhealthy artery of the brain. The lack of blood flow causes the tissue the artery supplies to become starved or ischemic. Similarly, the blockage may be due to an embolus, a blood clot that forms elsewhere in the body and travels to the brain. The embolus lodges in a narrowed artery and obstructs blood flow. Okay. I'm going to skip to the next video, which shows an example of what the bleeding stroke would look like. During a hemorrhagic stroke, abnormal bleeding disrupts normal blood flow. For example, in an intracerebral hemorrhagic stroke, a blood vessel bursts, spilling blood directly onto your brain while robbing the intended tissue of nourishment. Both the hemorrhage and lack of blood supply, called ischemia, destroy brain tissue. A subarachnoid hemorrhagic stroke occurs when a weak spot in a blood vessel wall, called an aneurysm, bursts and leaks blood into the tight space between your brain and your skull. The high-pressure bleeding results in serious damage to brain tissue. So I think those videos illustrate pretty well. It helps you to visualize the two types of stroke. And when I go forward, if I reference them, I'll call them a clot-based stroke or a bleeding stroke. Yes. A TIA will actually cover in a couple slides, but very good question. So these numbers stay the same. 87% to 13% over time. Also, if you look at data for the UK, Canada, Australia, the numbers are always pretty much the same. So the majority of strokes are clot-based. But let's talk about some risk factors first, because we also want to talk about how to prevent stroke in the first place. And we know that we have two types of risk factors. We have modifiable and non-modifiable. Modifiable risk factors are those that you can control. Modifiable are those that you can't. The reason we talk about both is because even if you can't control something, you need to know about it. You need to understand your risks so you can help protect yourself. Of the modifiable ones, the first one is age. So I think the question earlier is, what age range do strokes happen? And strokes happen at all age ranges. But we do know that every decade after the age of 55, your risk of a stroke goes up. However, we are seeing more stroke in younger people, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Family history plays a big role. If you have a mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, brother, sister that have had a stroke, it puts you more at risk for a stroke. Race plays a role. We know that certain races, there are genetic components, and there's also socioeconomic components to stroke. It's been researched. So African Americans are two and a half times more likely than non-Hispanic whites to have a first-time stroke. And Hispanics are 2.1 times more likely than non-Hispanic whites to have a first-time stroke. Certain races have a genetic predisposition to other risk factors, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, but it's also been shown in the research that lack of access to care and lack of access to healthy food plays a big role in that. Sex plays a role. 
More women than men have strokes, and more women than men die of strokes. The reason for that is pregnancy, hormonal changes, and women live longer than men. Um, the question here about TIA, so some of these other factors. First of all, having a stroke puts you more at risk for a second stroke. TIA, what a TIA is, people call that a mini stroke. That's when you have stroke symptoms, but then they go away. And then if you get your head imaged, there's no damage. What we tell people though, oftentimes people who have those, they have the symptoms, they go away. We still encourage them to go to the hospital. Call 911 and go to the hospital. Because it's the same thing as having chest pain before you have a heart attack. Something's not right, your body's trying to tell you something, it just took care of it in the meantime. But we know that people who've had that mini stroke, that TIA, are five to ten times more likely to have a full stroke in the next three days. So it's a very big risk factor. It's like your body telling you something's happening. And then heart attack. Anything that's good for your heart is good for your brain. Anything that's bad for your heart is bad for your brain. So any damage to your heart, damage to your blood vessels, puts you at risk for a stroke. The list of modifiable risk factors is a lot longer. The number one up there is high blood pressure. Number one risk factor for both types of stroke. Reason being, if you think about your blood vessels, they should be smooth on the inside and elastic. So the blood can flow through easily and they can respond to changes in pressure. What happens over a lifetime of high blood pressure is the inner lining of your blood vessels get damaged. They get scarred and bumpy. They're not smooth anymore. And they lose their elasticity. And so when the blood flows through them, the blood cells hit that scarred portion, the jagged portion, and they break up. And then they start to form clots because that's what the blood cells do when they break up. Also, if there's high pressure and they hit the walls that are not elastic, they break up. And that also causes them to form clots. Cigarette smoking is an independent risk factor, meaning if you had no risk factors, if you were the healthiest person out there, but you smoke cigarettes, it puts you at a higher risk of stroke because the carbon monoxide and the nicotine in the cigarette smoke act on your blood vessels just like high blood pressure does. As a state, the state of Illinois is doing better and one of the best in the country at decreasing the amount of cigarette smoking because of our policies, how expensive it is, you can't smoke in bars and restaurants, but what we're seeing, looking at a, a recent update from the American Heart Association, is that we're seeing an increase in vaping and e-cigarettes in, in the younger generation, which is just as dangerous, not as well studied, but it's interesting, we're getting better at one thing and then getting worse at another thing. Diabetes, um, as a disease in itself, damages your blood vessels based on the chemistry of the disease and how it works. Also, people with diabetes are more at risk for high blood pressure. Carotid, artery disease, any sort of disease in your blood vessels. Your heart has to work with your blood vessels to pump blood through them to get to your brain. So any sort of blood vessel disease can put you at risk for a stroke. Atrial fibrillation. That's the most common abnormal heart rhythm. I'm sure many of you have seen the commercials for Perdaxa or Eliquis where the guy's playing guitar. Essentially what atrial fibrillation is, it's where the top chambers of your heart don't beat in rhythm with the bottom chambers. So instead of doing this, they quiver. And what happens with atrial fibrillation is oftentimes people don't know they have it. Unless your heart's racing or unless you get an EKG, you might not know that you're having this abnormal heart rhythm. And so while the top chambers of the heart are quivering, the blood sloshing around, and when the blood sloshes around, it tends to form clots. And then if you get a good heartbeat, that's when it can send out a blood clot, like in the video we saw, that can travel up to your brain. Also, when you look at aging, every decade after the age of 75, people's risk of atrial fibrillation goes up higher and higher, which makes um, that one of the risk factors as well. High cholesterol. High cholesterol can cause blockages in your vessels and damage the inner lining of your blood vessels. And these bottom three down here all go together. Stress, physical inactivity, and obesity put people at risk for high blood pressure. So when you see all these risk factors, that's a lot. And let me go back a second before we go forward. Um, we'll talk in a little bit about um, a better way to think about this without having to memorize every single risk factor and ways that you can take a little better care um, of yourself. I put this in here, a lot of numbers. I'm not going to go too much into it. But the one point I wanted to make with this graph is um, up until about a year and a half ago, your physician would say that you had high blood pressure if on two different readings at two different times, your top number, your systolic, was 140 or greater. That's what they used to say high blood pressure started there. But a year and a half ago, the American Heart Association, along with a bunch of other physician associations, changed the definition of what high blood pressure is. And now 
high blood pressure starts with two different readings at two different times where the top number is 130 or above. So that took a lot of people in the country that did not have high blood pressure and gave them high blood pressure. But the reason they're being more cautious is because looking at data over years and years of research they have now, um, how damaging high blood pressure is and how cautious they need to be. So now what we would say is if on two different readings at two different times your top number is 130 or greater, you would be considered to have high blood pressure. And that's a conversation to have with your provider, um, but just to know Physicians are getting more and more cautious about how they manage blood pressure because of how big a role it plays in heart health and brain health. And my blood pressure is usually around 124, so I'm even creeping up there. Everybody, it's, it, it put a lot of people in that range. What I want to do for the next two to three minutes, one of the pieces of paper you took is this very colorful test here. This is just for your own eyes. Take a look over the next two to three minutes and try to check off what you can check off. And if it's unknown, Check it in the red and just take a look. This is a stroke risk factor quiz that was put together by the American Heart Association. So now that you've taken a minute, I think what stands out to me is all the unknowns. And so what we always try to tell people is you need to know your numbers. Just not knowing a number puts you at high risk because you're not sure. So we always encourage people to work with their providers. Know what your blood pressure is. If you take blood pressure medicine, make sure you have a blood pressure machine at your house and make sure you take your blood pressure daily. Make sure you know what medications you're taking. Make sure you know that sort of stuff because it can help protect you. And if you're low risk, that's great. Some things you can't control like family history and everything. I have some things in the high risk, um, but you have to know about it. And so talking about prevention, what I mentioned with all those risk factors, that's a big list. But the American Heart Association coined what they call Life Simple 7. They broke it down, seven simple, not always easy ways to protect your heart and your brain. And this is their recommendation. And so when you look at these, these top three here, managing your blood pressure, controlling your cholesterol, and reducing your blood sugar, they call those health factors. These bottom four, getting active, eating better, losing weight, and stopping smoking, they call those lifestyle factors. When we looked at the recent 2018 data as a country, we're doing better at all these three health factors. That's probably because those can all be managed with medication. You work with your providers, you can take pills for your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and your blood sugar. What we're staying the same at, and as a country getting slightly worse at, are these lifestyle factors. The caveat being, as a state of Illinois, we're doing quite well with the decreasing the amount of people that smoke. But like I said, even though we have policies and ways to stop people from smoking, we're seeing more younger people with vaping and e-cigarettes. But especially when you look at these three, getting active, eating better, and losing weight, as a country, we're staying the same and getting a little worse. We're seeing a lot less activity, especially in younger people. And what the recommendations are from the American Heart Association is three to four days a week, 30 minutes of moderate exercise. Now, moderate is individual for each person. One person's moderate could be a three mile run, and one person's moderate could be a 10 minute walk. But research has shown that any activity is better than none. They took a group of people and they had them substitute 10 minutes of sitting for 10 minutes of just walking, any sort of activity. And the mortality, so the death rate in those people went down 9%. So any activity is good activity. That's what we like to tell people. Whatever you can do to get active is better for your heart and better for your brain. Eating better. There's no specific diet that I'll talk about. That could be a whole lecture in itself. Um, if you have a specific diet from your physician, maybe it's a heart healthy diet or a diabetic diet, we recommend you follow that one. But it's all the heart healthy stuff. So diet high in fruits and veggies, low in saturated fat. The two biggest factors that contributed to poor diet in the most recent um, set of data from the American Heart Association is our sodium intake with our Western diet and our consumption of what they call um, SSBs, sugary sweetened beverages. That's their way of saying pop. So consumption of that, those are the two big factors. There's other factors, but those are the two main things when they look at people's diets across the entire country. And then losing weight um, helps people to be active and helps um, decrease blood pressure. So when you think about it, those are the seven things you can work on. Um, like I said, simple, not easy, but best ways to protect your heart and your brain. And a little thing on medications, we always ask you to take your medications as they're prescribed. Um, 
we strongly um, discourage people from stopping a medication without talking to their provider first. Sometimes people take the medication, they feel better, and they stop it. But the reason they feel better is because it's working. If it's a financial issue, then there's ways we can help with that. Um, but it's always so important. And one thing we always like to highlight, um, I'm lucky enough to work with the mobile stroke unit team, and in doing that, have met the paramedics and worked with the EMS world a lot over the last year. And it's very eye-opening what every single paramedic says is that if you take medications, you should keep a list, an updated list of your medications, and keep it on your fridge. Because when they come into your house, if there's no one else there that knows where your medication list is, if they have to root through your house, they will because they need to understand what medications you take so they can help you. But they all say, keep it on the fridge somehow. That way they know right where to go. That's the first place they're going to look. And if it's updated, it'll help them figure out how to best help you. What I want to do is move on a little bit to talking about how to recognize the symptoms of a stroke and then why it's so important to call 911. I don't want you to get nervous about this slide. This is not an anatomy class, although I've taught many of those and I love them. I just wanted to point out why strokes look so different for different people. The front part of my brain controls people's personality. Sometimes people have had a stroke, their personality changes, their inhibitions. They don't interact what you would think is socially appropriately. Right here, where the blue meets the green, is a very important area, and that's the area that controls what people feel and their voluntary movement. So oftentimes, you see someone, you think about a stroke patient, one side of their body is paralyzed, I heard, you lose sensation. That's why, because a big area right here controls the ability to say, reach out, and this is my water cap. I'm going to go ahead and turn it left and open it. You lose that ability. In the back of the brain, the red part, that's where vision is. So one of the symptoms can be a loss of vision. It can be double vision. And down here by where my ear would be, this is where hearing and speech is controlled. So a big part of stroke, if you think about stroke people, I um, think someone said in the beginning, speech difficulties. That's one of the symptoms. And then down here in the back, this part of the brain controls balance. So sometimes people stumble. They actually cannot coordinate and balance themselves. So a sudden loss of balance is one of the signs and symptoms. Um, and that's my whole anatomy portion of the, the class. There is no test afterwards, um, but it is very interesting. But this is what to think about. And this is what we're getting out there with all of our education. We want to tell people, remember, be fast. We used to go out, and you might have seen a media campaign a couple years ago from the American Heart Association about act fast. But the FAS only covers about 89% of strokes. Be fast covers 99% of strokes. All of these are sudden symptoms. So B stands for a sudden loss of balance. E stands for a sudden loss of vision in one or both eyes. F stands for a sudden uneven facial droop. If someone looks like they have a facial droop but it's very slight, you can for tell them to smile. If you force them to smile, it will exaggerate the asymmetry. A stands for sudden arm weakness. It can be weakness in the leg too. The key thing is it's sudden weakness on one side of the body. But if you have someone hold up their arms like they're holding a pizza and they're having weakness, one of the arms is going to drift downward. And S stands for sudden slurred speech or trouble speaking. It could be slurred speech or they could have clear speech, but it's all of a sudden like you're speaking a different language to them or what they're saying to you makes no sense. They're trying to say car, but they're saying chair, and they're getting really frustrated. Um, and you can pick up on it. Any one of these is a symptom of a stroke, and we would tell people it's time to call 911. Oftentimes, people think they have to have all five of these to be a stroke. Any one of these would be the symptom of a stroke. And oftentimes, people can talk themselves out of it. I'll go take a nap. I have low blood sugar. Um, we, get into, we get real questions. How much does an ambulance ride cost? I don't have insurance. What we would encourage people is to call 911 anyways because we'd much rather you call and have it not be a stroke than to not call and have it be a stroke because our ability to intervene and help and prevent disability, um, the quicker, the better. And we will talk about that a little bit. Um, I want to show this quick video. This is a great commercial. Now he's been wanting to put garlic chives in everything. <laughs> well, not everything. Dad? The sight of your face is drooping. Mom? It's probably nothing. Dad, are you okay? You're slurring. Why are you slurring? Raise your arms up in the air for me. Dad, are you okay? Gracie, call 911. 
I just Honey? Oh, Tim! 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 Tim, look at me, Gracie. Tell them to hurry. Tim, look at me. Look at me, Tim. I don't know. I think he's having a stroke. I think my dad is having a stroke. Tim, Tim, what's going on? My husband. He. He. I think he's cold. Are you cold, honey? Are you cold? Okay. Gracie. See, Gracie's going to come, sweetheart. We're just going to go. We're just going to go in the ambulance right now. We're going to go to the hospital. Okay? Okay. Huh? I'm right here. I'm right here. Gracie, meet us there. I'm right here. I'm right here. Okay. Okay, here we go. You just stay right here. You just stay and breathe. Huh? Just breathe. Tim? Tim? Dad? How are you feeling? I'm fine. Well, you've had a stroke. But because you got here quickly, you're looking at a full recovery. Hi. So kind of an intense commercial, but a good one. You can see the symptoms he had. He had facial droop on the right side and right-sided weakness. So now that we've uh, talked about that, I'm going to put you guys the test after I talk a little bit about some words from survivors. So these are words. Um, the American Heart Association website keeps a list of survivor stories and some um, great testimonies here. Up here, timing is everything. Getting help as fast as possible was my saving grace. If my mom hadn't have been there, I would likely either not be here or have disabilities now. But because she was so fast at calling 911 and getting me help, I have no disabilities, and I can function and live my everyday normal life. Stroke can happen to anybody. I'm a prime example of that, because I knew what I could push my body to do, and I knew I was living life right health-wise. What I didn't know was that I was at a higher risk of stroke because of my family history. Please, please, please go to the doctor. Get yourself checked first. And what this person is referencing is checking your blood pressure, checking your blood sugar. If you have to go on a medication, do it. And then I don't want anyone to go through what I've gone through. What's so frustrating to me is realizing how preventable all this was. And so now I'm going to put you guys the test. This is a pretty easy test, but we're going to um, use that BFAST acronym. So you have a 70-year-old man, went to bed. He was fine, went to bed at 8.30. Around midnight, his family members heard a loud thud, and they came upstairs. They found him on the floor. So the man was pointing to his head. And when he was speaking to them, um, he was unable to tell them what had happened. They couldn't understand him. So what do you think his symptoms are? Does he have a stroke symptom? What is it? Could be balance. What else? Speech. And so one of the big things is if you recognize stroke in someone, the paramedics and the medical team are always going to ask, when were they last well? When did the symptoms start? And so when, when would you say he was last seen well? 830. You guys are good. You have a 65-year-old man, history of alcohol abuse, diabetes, prior heart attack. Uh, family comes over for dinner at 5.30. They hear a loud noise in the kitchen. Um, he has a history. It's not current. Upon finding him on the floor in the kitchen, he stands right back up. He says he's fine. He just got really dizzy all of a sudden. He needs to go lay down. And he walks off down the hall towards his room and walks directly into the corner of the wall as if he didn't even see it. So what would some of his symptoms be? Vision, balance. And when did the symptoms start? 5.30. Then the last one, 32-year-old woman, while in a 10 a.m. meeting at work, she begins to stutter, then becomes increasingly anxious. When her coworker asks if everything is OK, all she can say is her name and the word hello. Her symptoms are, you guys are good. So now that we've been able to recognize it, talked about the risk factors, we do want to talk a little bit about what treatment is out there should it happen. Treatment for that clot-based stroke, there's two main things we can do. Our gold standard is our clot-busting drug called TPA. That can, that can be given up to four and a half hours after the stroke starts. That's why it's so important to act quickly and to know when the stroke started. It's given via IV. We have it in the back of our mobile stroke unit. It's in the emergency department as well. It gets in your bloodstream, and it breaks up blood clots. Studies have shown that every 15 minutes you shave off 
of giving that to someone, the quicker you give it. Every 15 minutes, you give them back one month of functional life, um, which they talk about a lot in stroke, the ability to be interactive and um, not have to be in rehab. At the same time, as we're giving that clot busting drug at CDH, because we're a comprehensive stroke center, we can do clot removal, or what we call a mechanical thrombectomy. What that is, they'll put a catheter in your groin in the IR lab where they do the heart caths. They can get the catheter all the way up into your brain, find the clot, and pull it right out. We can offer that up to 24 hours after the stroke, and that's what this is kind of a drawing of. It looks like a little corkscrew that goes to the blood clot and pulls it out. Up until a year and a half ago, we were only able to offer this up to six hours after a stroke because the research showed it worked up to six hours, and it was safe. And so we had a big population of people who would go to bed at 9 o'clock, wake up at 5, having stroke symptoms, but because they couldn't tell us when the stroke actually started, because most people don't wake up when they're having a stroke because it doesn't hurt, we would call them wake-up strokes. And that's about 50,000 people across the country. But now, because of advanced imaging and advanced research, we're getting great results up to 24 hours. So we've been able to expand what we can offer people. That's one of the reasons that it's dropping as the leading cause of death and more people are surviving it. But even so, the quicker the better. And then for the bleeding stroke, what we can do if the bleeding is caused by an aneurysm, which that's what that is, imagine a bicycle inner tube where a little weak portion balloons out until it pops. If the bleeding is caused by an aneurysm, we can go into the catheter lab and get the catheter right into the aneurysm and fill it with glue to stop the bleeding. Um, also, we know that there are a large amount of people that take blood thinners for heart conditions, um, other conditions. Um, on our mobile stroke unit and in the emergency room, if someone has a bleeding stroke, one of the first tests we're going to do is to see how thin the person's blood is. If their blood is too thin because of the blood thinners, we have medications to reverse that to stop the bleeding until we can get the person stabilized as well. And then last couple minutes, I'll talk a little bit about a mobile stroke unit, and then I'll open it up for questions. We are very lucky to have the mobile stroke in this area. It is, if you have not seen it, um, it's the size of a squad fire truck. It's 36 feet long, 33,000 pounds. It's an ICU on wheels, and it's one of only 20 in the world and one of only two in the state. The reason you won't see one of these on every street corner is because they cost about a million and a half dollars. It was purchased with a um, grant from our foundation at Northwestern Medicine. Has a crew of four people, a driver, a CT technologist, a critical care nurse, and a critical care medic. So say they come to someone's house, they'll park in front of the house, the nurse and the medic will go inside the house. They have an iPad with them, they can immediately pull up the neurologist right there and they can examine the patient right there. While they're doing that, the driver is gonna level the truck. The truck has to be perfectly level for the CT scanner to work. And the CT technologist is going to go in the back of the truck and turn on the scanner. It takes about seven minutes to power it up. So in about 10-ish minutes, they can assess the patient, get the truck and the scanner ready, and they can go scan the person right there in the driveway. The scan is immediately sent to the hospital where it's read by the neurologist and the radiologist, and then we're able to give care if the need be. We've been able to cut our call to care time, so when a person initially calls 911, by about 30 to 45 minutes. And that's the difference between someone walking out of the hospital, going home, and going to rehab. So an excellent thing to offer. We are operational. Um, that's a look in the back. So it has a full-size CT scanner in it. It's very, very impressive. And we're operational 365 days a year, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. The reason for that time frame is because we looked at the data, and about 75% of the people who call 911 for stroke call during that time frame. Because, like I said, people don't necessarily wake up from their sleep if they're having a stroke. It doesn't hurt. What happens is people wake up in the morning and they start to move around, and that's when you start to get the calls. We're always evaluating the data to see if we need to be open longer. But we're open that time. We serve this area around CDH, Wheaton, Winfield, West Chicago, Carroll Stream, Glen Ellen, and Roselle. And we also provide intercept service for St. Charles, Geneva, Batavia, Fox River Countryside, Elburn, North Aurora, Sugar Grove, and Fermilab. Intercept service, meaning if Sugar Grove calls us, we're not going to drive out to Sugar Grove. We're going to meet them halfway. So we have specific points like the Charlestown Mall parking lot, the Fox Valley Ice Arena parking lot, where the two rigs will back up back to back and be able to transfer the patient over. We're seeing the volume go up and still being able to deliver excellent care. So it's really a great thing to have in the area. It's the only one associated with a community hospital. All the rest are big teaching centers. Um, but CDH is a great hospital, and it's affiliated with Northwestern. 
Um, the other one in the state is at Rush Oak Park downtown. So the only one in this area. And that's my presentation. Well, thank you so much, and have a great day.